Donald Trump is the most unpopular president in modern times. With his approval rating at a paltry 33%, Trump failed on health care reform and was humiliated with leaked transcripts from private calls with the leaders of Mexico and Australia. Yesterday, the Russian investigation took an ominous turn with special counsel Robert Mueller turning to a grand jury in Washington. So what do you do if you're Donald Trump to lift your spirits? You stage a raucous rally in West Virginia, a state where he beat Hillary Clinton by 42 points. The crowd received a special treat. Turncoat Democratic Governor Jim Justice switched parties live on stage. This wasn't surprising. The Washington Post reports that Governor Justice is a billionaire coal magnate who declined to endorse Hillary Clinton in 2016. Justice is famous for bringing a plate of cow manure into the state capitol to express what he thought about a Republican passed budget. Well, at least he got something right. In fine Trumpian tradition, Governor Justice also appears to be a deadbeat. The Post reports that the state tax department has filed four liens this year against one of Justice's companies, citing nearly one million in unpaid taxes, interest, and penalties related to these coal mines. Trump used the rally to push back against the Russia investigation. There were no Russians in our campaign. There never were. Probably not. The Russians are likely waiting where we usually find them, in the White House or back at Trump Tower, palling around with Don Trump Jr. We didn't win because of Russia. We won because of you. That I can tell you. While Trump says, we won because of you, he is breezily dismissing the incontrovertible fact that the people at his rally were surely victims of Vladimir Putin's influence campaign, which flooded the internet with conspiracy theories and lies about Hillary Clinton. Obviously, that must have affected their views on her. At the rally, the president forcefully called for the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. How will this affect West Virginians? According to Forbes, West Virginia is the nation's second poorest state. 34% of non-elderly West Virginians are on Medicaid. 184,000 West Virginians could lose their health insurance. A study by the New England Journal of Medicine found that for every 455 people who gained coverage, one life was saved. That translates into 409 dead West Virginians each year. An estimated 16,000 jobs would be lost by 2019. Nearly 350 million would be lost in tax revenue over five years. The Urban Institute estimates West Virginia would lose 14 billion in federal funds between 2019 and 2028, including 12 billion supporting Medicaid CHIP. CHIP, by the way, stands for the Children's Health Insurance Program. You know, protection for their own children. Given these numbers, the majority of people in West Virginia are either nihilistic masochists who put party before the health of their own families, including their children, or they simply aren't aware that replacing Obamacare with Trump kill will ensure they can't go to the doctor when they're ill, which is kind of sick if you think about it. The lyrics in John Denver's famous song about West Virginia, Take Me Home Country Roads, are, quote, life is old there, older than the trees. If Obamacare is repealed, don't bet on it. Now it's time for the News Bin with Wayne Besson. Welcome back to the Wayne Besson Show. You know what really pisses me off? Drives me insane. These whiny insurance companies. They have people by the you-know-what. And they can get away with whatever they want, including, some would argue, murder by denying health insurance or making it too expensive to pay for. In Illinois, health insurance companies have announced that premiums could rise by as much as 43%. Who the hell can afford a 43% rise in premiums? It's not like they haven't gone up every year. And these health insurance companies, you're not going to believe this, the nerve of them, they are saying that they are raising these premiums because of the, quote, uncertainty of the market. Now, what is the uncertainty? Well, it's Donald Trump and the congressional Republicans who are saying, hey, you know, we might not pay our bills. We might not pay providers. And because of this uncertainty, they are raising their rates. Well, wait a minute. For, wait a second. If it's uncertain for the health insurance companies that have oodles of money, isn't it even more uncertain and precarious for people who don't have that kind of money and who need health insurance? The games that health insurance companies play with people's lives is unconscionable. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. In fact, 
I, I don't know why health insurance companies exist. They do nothing. They serve no purpose. They are no more than a middleman that is in, in the way, quite frankly, of good health care. What does a health insurance company do? A health insurance company, they take money from your pocket that could otherwise be spent on actual health care. They pay insurance executives absurd sums of money so they can go off and buy yachts and vacation in places like Monte Carlo. That's what they do. They, they serve no purpose to actually improving health care. Now, a lot of conservatives would say, oh, wait a minute, we, need, we have to have a market. Really, why do we have to have a market for health insurance? It makes no sense whatsoever. Number one, when it comes to a market, there are winners and losers. Why should anybody lose when it comes to health care, especially when losing means losing your life? are losing your independence, are losing your ability to get through the day without suffering. So the, the idea of a market is ridiculous. Furthermore, insurance is a gamble. For example, if you insure a piece of art, you're, you're ga they are gambling that it's not going to be stolen. But with health insurance, there is no gamble. Everybody gets sick. Everybody is going to die. So again, the idea of why we need insurance when it comes to health is preposterous. And you look at the insurance markets right now. How do they make their money? How do they succeed? How do they get those massive bonuses I was just complaining about? The answer is simple. What they do is they look for reasons to kick people off health care, especially if they think they're sick. It's by denying people coverage, by ensuring that some people cannot go to the doctor, cannot get treated, that is how they make their money. What kind of immoral business model is that? Quite, quite frankly, it's evil. That's what I would call it, evil. And the sooner we can dispense and get rid of health insurance companies, the better off this country is going to be. Of course, Republicans and even some Democrats, they are doing everything in their power to keep these insurance companies alive. Why is that? Simple. So they can get paid off in the form of campaign contributions. Because in America, that's all that matters today. Even with matters of life and death, it all comes down to the almighty dollar and who can pay off and funnel money into the campaigns, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but, of course, we know that most of the problem is with Republicans. They are the issue today, and they are deeper, much deeper in the pocket of the insurance agencies. Uh, let, let's move on uh, to Donald Trump right now. What, what a week he's had. We now have a grand jury in Washington that is looking into Trump at uh, Mueller's uh, discretion. And the president is obviously considering getting rid of, of, of Mueller. If he does that, we ought to take to the streets in mass. We ought to get out there and raise hell like we've never raised before. This is very problematic when it comes to our president right now. I mean, you look at what this means. What are the stakes of a grand jury? Well, in USA Today, uh, they discussed some of them regarding the uh, looking into collusion. Here, let's take a listen to, uh, let's actually look at uh, what, uh, what Jimmy Grewell, who is a former assistant attorney general in George H.W. Bush's administration said. He said that this suggests meaning the grand jury, that there is evidence that a crime may have been committed and there is a need to apply the legal tools of a grand jury to, uh, that can, they can bear. It's pretty serious. Pretty serious. Jens David Olin, a vice dean and professor at Cornell Law School and an expert on criminal law, said, quote, this suggests the investigation will end with indictments. And that is scaring the hell out of Trump. Now, I know there are many... And we saw a lot of these sycophantic apparatchiks at the Trump rally in West Virginia who still deny that there's anything wrong here. As if all of these Russians just keep popping up like whack-a-mole in the weirdest, darndest places with Trump operatives. Not low level, but the highest level, including his son. And none of these high-level operatives and family members can remember a single Russian 
as if they're invisible. How do you forget all these Russians? I remember Russians when I meet them. What, what, is, what is it? Are they getting brainwashed? This is more than a mere coincidence. Something stinks. Every honest person knows this. The problem is Donald Trump supporters aren't very honest with themselves. And they're defiant. On some level, many of them know they made a mistake with Donald Trump. They're embarrassed by it. They're humiliated. They put this buffoon in office that's hurting the country. And they don't want to admit that yet. They don't want to give liberals the satisfaction of saying, you know, we really screwed up our, our nation. We really harmed America. They're not going to say that for a while. Eventually, I think they'll say it. Just as with George W. Bush, people finally figured out on the right that he was an awful president, probably a war criminal. And that is why George W. Bush was not invited to the Republican convention or given a small role. He was banished for all intents and purposes. Same thing with Donald Rumsfeld. They loved him, they loved him, and loved him until they didn't. The same will happen with Donald Trump as sure as the sun rises and sets, I guarantee it. But it will take a while. That's why he still has an 89% approval rating among conservative Republicans but only a 33% approval rating in a Quinnipiac poll this week with the general public. Big gap there, but that will not last. That will fall. But Donald Trump ought to be terrified. And, you know, these supporters, they can only bury their head in the sand so long. I hear some of these supporters say, oh, Russia is a big nothing burger. You know, these people would say, there's no burger there. There's no, there, it's a nothing burger. If they were caught at a Burger King with a Whopper in their hand, gnawing on it, they'd say, what, bur- what burger are you talking about? I don't see a burger, big, big nothing. Even as the, the meat was uh, uh, in their mouth. And you could see it. Disgusting, I know. But you, you get my point. No matter what happens, they are using alternative facts and denying reality. They're just a bunch of Orwellian apparatchiks. They are willing to call black white and white black and say the sky is not blue when it suits their purposes. They'll say anything. I mean, they are in complete denial. And you saw that rabid crowd in West Virginia yesterday. I talked earlier in the show about how harmful the repeal of Obamacare would be for West Virginia. It would actually cripple that state. It would be a nightmare. It would be as big of a nightmare for West Virginia as Donald Trump for president is for the rest of America. And and how about uh, what Donald Trump did this week? He has his calls released with the Australian and Mexican leaders. He looks like a groveling weenie who really doesn't care about the wall when he was talking with the Mexican president. Oh, you just, just, I don't want to look like a fool. It's all about me and my promise. And as if Mexico is supposed to operate as if they're working on his campaign. How embarrassing was that for us? And then, of course, you have Donald Trump lying on, on two different occasions in terms of calls. The first call was he said that the president of the Boy Scouts called him and said it was such a great speech he gave. No, that call never happened. Same thing with the Mexican president. Trump said, oh, yeah, he, he called. It was a telephone call, and he said, my immigration policy is great. No, that call didn't happen. Who is this man? What kind of person makes up calls that didn't happen in such a high position of power? The issue we have here is we have a president who has been lying for so long. It's pathological, we all know it. He's been lying for so long. He doesn't know how to tell the truth. Think about that for a moment. You've lied so long you don't know how to tell the truth. It's a sad state of affairs for this country, and it's a scary one for the world because Donald Trump is our leader. By the way, I, I, the whole thing with North Korea is scaring the hell out of me. And Iran, Russia. I'm going to talk more about this later, but we say we have the strongest military in the world, and we spend more than what is it, the next eight or nine nations combined. We have more hardware and and more sophisticated hardware and software. We have a great military training force. But how good is our military when Donald Trump is commander-in-chief? 
How good are we then when he is the one making the decisions? It's like putting my dog Doinkers in the seat of a Ferrari. Yeah, the machine is great, but my dog is driving it. It's probably not going to end well. It's the same with Donald Trump. It's like having my dog driving a Ferrari. And what's going to happen? Well, it's going to crash. We'd have to actually think about the prospect of losing a war if we got in one. Literally losing. Because Donald Trump would make some horrendous decisions. And I know some people say, oh, the president doesn't have that big of a, a role. The president just uh, makes larger strategic decisions and the military carries out the operations. Do you really believe that, anyone? Do you really believe in your right mind that Donald Trump isn't going to try to micromanage some of the wartime tactics, not to mention strategy? He already said he knows more than the generals during the campaign. It's gonna, it reminds me of a Hitler during World War II when he went into... When he went into the Soviet Union, he goes into to Russia. All the military people said, pull back, it's getting cold, we're going to freeze. And Hitler said, go ahead. And what happened? They froze and lost the war. Not, again, no, I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler in, in that broader sense, but in terms of somebody, my point is somebody who would insert himself to make military decisions because he thinks he knows more than the generals. Scary, if you think about it. And then this week we had, we had the, the Justice Department under Jeff I Hate Pot Sessions uh, who said that he is going to pursue the greatest issue we have, the greatest problem we have in this country, which is anti-white bias. Because, you know, when I saw that crowd cheering Trump in West Virginia tonight, the first thing I thought is it must be really hard to be white in West Virginia. I, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how these people who are white in West Virginia survive given all the, the discrimination. I mean, these Trump people are just the whiniest crybabies. Talk about liberals being snowflakes. All they do is whine and the media this and, and the immigrants that and the Muslims and gays. It's everybody's fault but their own. Everybody's fault but their own. Jeff Sessions is on the bubble. Trump has been attacking him. And uh, part of me wants to see him get fired. Now, it would be a disaster in terms of uh, this country. Trump trying to insert a, a yes man as attorney general. That's what he thought Sessions was going to be. And he didn't get what he wanted. So uh, if he does get rid of Sessions, it will be good in some ways. For one, this whole war on drugs that he is about to relaunch, even though we know it didn't work the first time, is going to harm a lot of people. It's going to destroy their lives. Instead of people being free, working for a living, having a family, instead, that's all going to be destroyed and they will go to jail. And now Jeff Sessions, even if you're not guilty, he can claim, well, you might be guilty and he can take your property away from you. That's that's insane. Crazy policy. And, and uh, you, you talk about marijuana, though, for a moment. There was a really good article in USA Today. It was a, a letter to the editor by Robert Sharp. Common Sense for Drug Policy Director. And he was talking about how marijuana should be used to cut down on the opioid epidemic, the one that Republicans, such as Donald Trump, claim to care about. In fact, he got in trouble with that during his call to the Mexican president when he said that uh, New Hampshire was uh, a drug den. Everybody's upset there. I mean, they, are, they have a drug problem, but it's a beautiful state. Uh, but the, the uh, Robert Sharp from Common Sense for Drug Policy said today, quote, he wrote, uh, the opioid commission created by President Trump failed to mention the potential role of marijuana in reducing overall deaths. Research, public, uh, research published in the Journal of American Medical Association shows that states with legal medical marijuana access have a 25% lower opioid overdose death rate. The phrase, if it saves one life, has been used to justify drug war abuses. Legal marijuana access to East pain has the potential to save thousands of lives. Amen. We are insane if we don't legalize and tax marijuana. And this, again, a lot of people would do that instead of opioids. They really would. It would help them relax. They are taking these drugs to relieve anxiety, much of it because of Republican economic policies. This is Wayne Besson, and I'll be back in a moment after these messages. 
If you love The Wayne Besson Show, become a member today. Go to waynebessonshow.com and hop on Besson's bandwagon. That's right, join Besson's bandwagon today for $10 a month. That's it, just $10 a month. That's $120 a year. And support progressive media. Support independent media. Support The Wayne Besson Show. Coming up next, I interview Bob Ryder, Secretary Treasurer for the Chicago Federation of Labor. On the phone with us right now, Bob Ryder, Secretary Treasurer of the Chicago Federation of Labor. How are you today? Wayne, I've never had it so good. Uh, how do you rate Labor Secretary Alexander Acosta so far? You know, he's, I, I tell you what, I, I don't want to say that he's been great, obviously, because there's a lot of stark things that I think we can expect from the uh, Department of Labor. But thank God we didn't get Andrew Puster. Yeah, he was a disaster. I mean, he was out absolutely uh, so hostile to labor, he almost defined himself by that hostility. I mean, I, Wayne, you know, you and I, I think, in the past have talked about Puzzer, and, you know, maybe one of our last conversations we had was about him. Now, with Acosta, Acosta's had, you know, some experience at the national level with labor issues through his time on the National Labor Relations Board. You know, I know that some people point to, some contracts he had with um, national people um, from the labor movement when he was in the private sector. But here's the thing that concerns me. Acosta, to me, is nothing but a, a player on the board. Mike Pence is one of the president's advisors, right? One of his closest mm -hmm. advisors. He's the guy that's, you know, out there, you know, whipping up uh, Congress when it comes to health care and other things. What concerns me is that, you know, Mike Pence is somewhere lurking in the background with uh, Acosta. And that's going to be the test, is when, it, is when the administration, specifically Mike Pence, says, hey, you know, we want to move some type of legislation that goes in the direction of right to work or, you know, you know taking, taking some sort of way to dilute prevailing wage. What's Acosta going to do then? Is he going to stand up and stand with people he stand up, stood up with in the past, or is he going to go the Pence route? Well, you, you, it's interesting. You mentioned Pence, and a lot of people want Donald Trump gone. He's obviously a threat to this country, and the world for that matter. But Pence is no great leader either. This guy is scary in his own right. Talk about his labor record in Indiana. Mike Pence is the poster boy for right to work. And if your listeners know anything about right to work, they know that it doesn't mean what it says. Right to work is all about, you know, keep, you know, putting unions on this uneven footing with with the employers in collective bargaining. Essentially what it says is that, you know, uh, employers can subvert the right to contract by um, forcing unions to represent people that in equity don't pay for the representation, which is ridiculous. It's very anti-Republican. It, it cuts against, quote-unquote, freedom to contract. And Mike Pence, you know, he's he's – he led this effort in Indiana, and according to, you know, I, I don't know if it was Sean Spicer or who it was, you know, several months back, said that uh, Donald Trump will follow Mike Pence's lead on issues like right to work. Yeah, he doesn't seem very interested uh, nor educated about a lot of major issues, whether it's health care or, or labor. So I think you're right. He will take his cue from Mike Pence and do whatever he wants. Plus, he is cow-cowing to the far right. We saw that in West Virginia yesterday. He understands that he has an approval rating of only 33%, according to the latest Quinnipiac poll, yet he's got an, he has an incredible approval rating among conservative Republicans, and thus he's going to do whatever he can to keep the base. So, so Pence will play a major role in this. Uh, but Labor has taken a good step in Chicago, and that has been the purchase of the Sun-Times. Talk about why this was so important in this city. Well, you know, I, I want to make sure people understand what the motivation is, because I know that it's easy to, you know, come to your own conclusions based on what the conservatives do when they get involved with media. You know, the CFL had a long history of... Um, occupying uh, multimedia back when we owned 
um, a legendary radio station, a top 40 radio station in Chicago, one of the biggest in the country at the time, WCFL, which we owned from the 1920s up until the late 1970s. And we understand the responsibility that you have when you have a major media property. So what we wanted to do is, you know, among other things, preserve the second voice, um, but also make sure that you had an ownership group that respected the profession of journalists. We represent people in a variety of different professions. And, you know, right now, one of the professions that we represent uh, through the labor movement are working journalists. And there's nothing that, you know, I've seen that's been under attack in such a visceral public way as as journalism. And it's it's one of, you know this, you they had a long career in journalism. It, it, it's something, it's a profession that deserves to be protected because of the important role it plays in educating the public. And, you know, I, if I have to, if I have to hear Donald Trump take the phrase fake news, which if you think about it, the, the, the majority of fake news um, sources out there, you know, uh, tip, in, tip into the Donald's favor in terms of, you know, propaganda, we, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we don't allow him to marginalize legitimate, legitimate news sources um, through, through this, you know, crazy campaign. But there's also the advantage to the editorial page. We've had two conservative editorial pages. In fact, Bruce Rauner was elected with the support of both the Sun-Times and the Chicago Tribune. So while the reporting and journalistic integrity will be protected, there is the advantage to that editorial page, giving Chicago another perspective, not just a conservative corporate one. Sure, sure. Well, but even, and even with that, you know, our responsibility is make sure the team's in place, right? If you look at, if you look at the editorials, that Chicago t- sometimes have been putting out the last couple of weeks, people are like, wow, <clears throat> you guys have had a real influence over there. We have not sat in or weighed in on one editorial meeting. You know, there's not been, you know, Jorge Ramirez, Bob Ryder, or any of our other union folks have not called up Jim Kirk or the other people on the editorial board, hey, you need to weigh in on this. We don't have to. If we have the right team in place, which we do, that they're going to do the right thing. And what I actually think has happened is I believe the editorial board at the Sun-Times, probably to some extent, I don't know if the, they would say this, and I'm not asking them to say this, but they probably feel liberated to some extent that they get to use, they get to be that voice that they want to be. And, and that's, that's really, you know, our role is to just give, is to make sure that we're picking the right people and that they have the latitude to do the right thing. What do you hope to gain by this? What would you call a success with the purchase of the Sun Times? I think expanding the Sun Times uh, in, in, to, from being a newspaper to being viewed as a as a all around news organization. You know, we we acquired a digital production company called Answers Media as part of the deal. Um, other um, traditional newspapers have moved into this space like the Washington Post and New York Times. And we don't, you know, right now we're not aspiring to be a national um, news organization, but we want to be, for Chicago and the Midwest, we want to be a place that people go to on their smartphones. We want to be what folks are sharing on Facebook and Twitter because we think we put we put out a good product and uh, we, we, we think that that iconic brand is always represented Every day, working class Chicago, whether you're whether you're black, white, Latino, a woman, a man, you're 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 uh, gay or straight. We think that it's always been the newspaper that speaks to the people who walk the who walk uh, down the sidewalks of uh, this great city. Yesterday, Donald Trump was in West Virginia. Again, Hillary Clinton lost by 42 points to Trump. This should be a state that is democratic. This should be a state that is pro-labor. In fact, right-to-work states, people make $6,000 less than states that aren't right-to-work. 
And yet there they were cheering Donald Trump like he was some kind of god yesterday. Have we reached those people who are voting against their own interests and undermining not just their economic uh, equality, but they're undermining their own health care? Uh, the statistics on health care were incredible. How many people would be harmed in West Virginia? It's the second poorest state. How does labor reach those people, shake them uh, for all intents and purposes, say, wake up, you're harming yourself? Yeah, so, I mean, each each state has sort of its own unique character and how they ended up in this. I mean, if you look at the, the election of Donald Trump, it's – it's not one thing that you can point to, but it's a series of things that happen. And let's take West Virginia, which has long been a uh, you know a cradle of the Democratic Party in in that Bible Belt area. Um, West Virginia was heavily reliant on the coal industry, right? And mm-hmm. you know the mine workers have continued to be a strong force in uh, in West Virginia. But then the coal industry became the center of the election, uh, you know, when it, when we're talking about the economy, and you know, the, the thing that we have to look at is how do we how do we reach out to those people and say whether you know if the coal industry is going to be strong or if the coal industry is going to go away, how can we be there for those folks to say this is what we can do for you on an economic level? And I mean, and that's. And they have, a, they have a great union with a long legacy that represents them, the mine workers. And the mine workers don't just represent people in the coal industry, but they're very cognizant of those jobs. And it gets complicated. Um, you know, I talked to um, a guy who's with the mine workers union in, uh, in, in Australia, works very closely with folks here. They represent more than just that industry, right? And, and it gets, you know, you get into this diversity of economy. And, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying that we need to you know subscribe to what's going you know how they structure themselves in Australia, but we need to we need to figure it out. We need to figure out how to have a strong economic message that brings people together and doesn't have them um, being fooled by Donald Trump. Because at the end of the day, the coal industry is gonna is gonna go away because of technology. It's gonna go away because people are gonna want clean energy. The, you know, no one, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, the, the only people that want to destroy the environment are the are the people, you know, that have always wanted to destroy it. You know, the, the quote unquote titans of industry, you know, the, the folks mm-hmm. who sit on top of the piles of cash. You know, the workers, they have concerns. If you work in petrochemical, if you work in the coal industry, you have concerns that you're going to lose, you know, that you're going to lose your job if you if, if, if those industries go away. But there are alternatives that we have to work with them on. I mean, I look at the IBW and, you know, they, they represent a ton of people in, you know, different uh, utility industries, and they've made so many advances with their members on pushing for solar and creating solar jobs. You know, and and, 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 um, mm-hmm. and I think the mine workers have worked on, on, on things like this, too, but we have to figure that out. We It's either that we have to find the answers or we have to com- we have to communicate that we we know what some of the answers are. So it's again, Wayne. This election, I think, is more about a breakdown in communication. You know, if you wanted to find something that could, you know, that could be, you know, broadly given as as a cause, a breakdown of communication in the American people. What do you think accounts for that, and how should we communicate? Well, I mean, broadly, as a as just a as just a regular everyday guy who's you know who's trying to raise a, a, a little boy and a little girl, I think we should, we need to start with respect. You know, I see, you know, uh, Trump's America, which which is not the majority of America, but, but Trump's America are empowered to say, you know, evil things to one another, right, to mm-hmm. appeal to folks' base, base or instinct. So I think there's a level of civility that's got to get injected back into – uh, society. I don't know how that happens, but I think we need to recognize, you know, in the, within the Democratic Party, right? We have we we have this idea, and, and I know you understand this. You know, you go, especially when you're when you're in places like New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles, we have the Democratic Party, which believes in two of the three legs at least, right, of the stool. 
They believe mm-hmm. in believe in civil rights. They believe in in protecting the environment, but they don't always get together on the economic piece. And you know, I you get surrounded by what I call cocktail party Democrats. The Democrats who try to huddle around candidates they think give get them into the coolest places, right? And 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 those Democrats who who are in office who want to, who who want to make sure that their friends get into the coolest places, and that that sounds a lot more like the you know just being a more cosmopolitan Republican party than really being a party that stands for working people, protecting the environment, and protecting folks with civil rights. Bob Ryder, Secretary Treasurer for the Chicago Federation of Labor. Thank you so much for appearing on the Wayne Besson Show. I hope you enjoyed the show today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you want, become a member. Support the show. Support independent media at WayneBessonShow.com. That's WayneBessonShow.com. If you hop on Besson's fan wagon, that's only $10 a month, $120 a year. And what that allows me to do is continue doing the show. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday.